On the 3rd of September 1915, here at the elegant Anglican Church of St John the Baptist in the heart of Canberra, arguably the most significant state funeral in the short history of the young Australian nation took place. The host of people in attendance came from all over the region, from Yass, from Queanbeyan, from Gundagai, from Goulburn, from Burrawa, from Bungendore, in such numbers that admission to the funeral ceremony had to be by ticket only. They came from interstate too. Some 70 VIPs accompanied the coffin in the seven coach train that headed up from Melbourne to Canberra. And these included the Prime Minister, Andrew Fisher, the Governor General, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson, the Leader of the Opposition, former Prime Minister Joseph Cook, Sir John Forrest, the member for Eden Monero, Austin Chapman, and dozens of other notable members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. All had made the pilgrimage to St John's and the Bush capital, citizens and political identities alike, to pay homage to William Throsby Bridges, the first commandant of the Royal Military College Duntroon, who had been killed just months earlier by a sniper's bullet in May 1915, barely three weeks into the ill-fated Gallipoli campaign in Turkey. After Bridges was buried at Alexandria in Egypt, his body was, shortly after, exhumed and brought home to Australia. He appears to have been the only Empire soldier ever to be formally accorded such treatment. A death of such significance, so sudden, so unexpected, was virtually certain to be woven into myth and legend. And so it proved, but in ways that could never have been predicted. The opening of RMC Duntroon took place on the 27th of June, 1911, just over a hundred years ago. As we continue to remember key Canberra centenary elements, Bridges' moving story and that of the fledgling college that he helped to establish, their fortunes so tightly interwoven, need recalling. Yet another of the national capital's potent foundation narratives, it is by parts achievement against the odds, high adventure, celebration, commemoration, myth, legend, but above all, tragedy. Bridges was born in Greenock, Scotland in 1861. His family migrated to Canada in the 1870s and in his teens, he entered Canada's Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. However, when the family moved in 1878 to Moss Vale, his mother's birthplace in far off New South Wales, Bridges soon followed. Unaffected by this disruptive experience, in Australia, Bridges began afresh, methodically pursuing a steadily more distinguished military career on the staff of the School of Gunnery at Sydney's Middle Head, in a cavalry division in the Boer War in South Africa, in the Department of Military Science at the University of Sydney, and then as an Australian representative on the Imperial General Staff in London. This last stint brought Bridges to the attention not only of the British military establishment, including the indomitable Lord Kitchener, but also the Australian Commonwealth Government of the day. After a survey of Empire defences, Kitchener recommended a training college for Australian Army officers. Prime Minister Fisher acted on it, and William Throsby Bridges was selected as the first head of the proposed institution. In a milestone speech in Yass in June 1912, Fisher boldly stated that his Labour Party had made Australia a nation, not only in name, but in fact also. And just as he deemed it imperative that the famed Oddy Telescope and Oddy Observatory had to be located in the nation's capital, so too did the country's first military facility. The RMC site was selected in November 1910. The lease of Duntroon House and estate signed in December of that year and almost immediately the call went out for local carpenters, plumbers, bricklayers, painters, horse drivers and labourers. 
From the outset, the new academy reflected the character of its first commandant. Bridges put his stamp on the place, and it seems that the Australian cadets quickly felt his authority. The first intake of what one journalist playfully referred to as embryo generals was selected on the basis of a widely advertised set of criteria. Cadets must be 15 to 19 years of age, unmarried, and able to pass exams in 11 separate subjects, including general knowledge. Cadets had to be physically fit, no squint allowed, no colour blindness, teeth in good order, and well-formed feet, toes and joints. No cadet could receive money from his parents without the sanction of the commandant, since distinctions of any kind between cadets would not be tolerated. No cadet shall drink any spirituous or intoxicating liquor, or bring or cause to bring the same into the college. There was not much that wasn't off limits under Bridges' forbidding regime, except pipe smoking and dancing under strict controls. Dancing escaped the net because, according to the set of Duntroon edicts of the time, it was very important that college graduates should be able to sustain their station in life. When Duntroon opened its gates in late June 1911, there were 41 new cadets, including nine New Zealanders. They would survive, and many thrive, in Canberra's bracing winter months in the years ahead, but unbeknownst to the expanding group of future officers, a global conflagration loomed ever closer. A total of 158 Duntroon graduates saw active service in the Great War, of whom 42 were killed or died of wounds, over 25% and another 58, or some 36%, were wounded. In certain symbolic ways, Brigadier General Bridges' fate was that of the Academy nurseries. So when his death was announced, a nation wept, and a Bush College mourned. Lieutenant General Birdwood acknowledged a debt that could never be repaid, particularly the inculcating of such high ideals into his Duntroon boys. For peerless war correspondent and historian Charles Bean, Bridges stood out beyond question by head and shoulders as the greatest soldier Australia has produced. Bridges' death was portrayed in terms unashamedly heroic, bordering on mythic. His untimely death demanded a comprehensive national response, and that is precisely what it got. Just two days after Bridges was interred at Chatby in Alexandria, Egypt, a highly confidential correspondence between Prime Minister Fisher and Governor-General Munro Ferguson began, with the sole aim of bringing Bridges' body back home. A close personal friend of Lady Bridges, the aristocratic Lady Munro Ferguson reputedly played a decisive role in repatriating Bridges' body, the only Australian body officially returned to the homeland until the interment of the unknown soldier on the 11th of November 1993. On the first day of the two-day funeral ceremony, the pallbearers included the Prime Minister, the Governor-General, the Leader of the Opposition and the Chief of the General Staff. Carriage of the body to Spencer Street Station to commence its journey to the National Capital was captured on what is now Precious Phil in the collection of the Australian War Memorial and the collection of the National Film and Sound Archive. The Melbourne eulogies emphasised Bridges' bravery as successive speakers sought to reconcile his inexplicable death with their Christian faith. After the St John's service, the funeral procession, we are told one full mile in length, stretched first to the Ainsley Post Office and then along the Yass Queenbean Road to Mount Pleasant. Keep the home fire 
With the body about to be lowered into the ground, Archbishop Wright struck an elevated note when he declared that this grave will be a place of inspiration for Australian leaders. It will silently appeal for that loftiest ambition. It was only appropriate that Canberra's remarkable designer, Walter Burley Griffin, should be appointed design consultant for the gravesite that would, for posterity, host Bridges' remains. The imposing location would soon be referred to as a shrine. Every Anzac Day, Duntroon cadets hold a memorial service at this site, an annual reconnection with a death almost a century ago which gave emotional shape to the new college, even as it sent waves of shock through a young and vulnerable nation. Music